Hey, good afternoon. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, this is my third high school that I've spoke to today, so if I lose my voice, just hang in there with me. How many of you have done any study about the Holocaust? Okay, good. The majority of you. So you know during the Holocaust there was three basic groups of people. There was the victims, six million documented Jews that were murdered, and five million other groups of people. And there was the perpetrators, Hitler, his army of SS officers, the Gestapo, the Nazis, big group of people. But there was one other very important group of people that weren't the victims or the perpetrators. And this other group of people is larger than both of those two combined. Do you have any idea who they'd be? You can yell out if you want. Any idea who this middle group is that isn't a victim or isn't a perpetrator? Okay. Bystanders. Yay! Bystanders. So the story that you're going to share here today is actually from a bystander's perspective and it's important to you because guess what, we all are today, we're bystanders. I hope that you're never in a bullying or you know, perpetrator group and I hope you're never in a victim group. But every day we're bystanders to the stuff that goes around us and there's all kinds of stuff. So the story you're hearing today is relevant because of that. And it's also relevant because my mom just graduated high school when all this stuff happened. And if my mom were here today, you'd see a woman that's about this tall. She had white fluffy hair and big blue eyes and she would sound like this. Good afternoon, my darling's children. I am so happy being here seeing all your beautiful faces. And mom started every single talk by saying this, I have come here today because I love you. And she'd mean that with her whole heart. My mom was born Irena Gut, or Irene, and she was born in Poland. And she was the oldest of five beautiful sisters, she used to say. Her father was an architect and her mom was a homemaker. And when mom graduated high school, her dream was to become a homemaker, I mean a nurse. And so her parents sent her off to nursing school. She'd never been away from home by herself, and so it was exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time. She'd literally only been to school about 10 days when one morning she left the dorm building. It had been sunny out, but when she walked outside, the sun was gone because overhead there was airplanes flying all over, dropping bombs everywhere without any warning Hitler had invaded Poland. It was September 1st, 1939. All communication was cut off. She couldn't call home and find out if her parents and her sisters were okay. They couldn't find out about her. They turned her school into like a makeshift hospital where they tried to take care of people that were wounded and injured. But 16 days later, Stalin from the Soviet Union also invaded Poland from the other end. And just like that, her whole country was gone. Mom said one afternoon there was this group of people who came by. They called themselves the Polish resistance or the partisans. And they were looking for volunteers, people who would join up and fight the enemies that had conquered Poland. So some of her teachers joined up and mom, who was just 17, she joined too. They literally had to go into the forest and dig holes in the forest floor to live in. They covered themselves with tarps. They had some blankets, some ammunition, but it starts getting really cold in Poland in the fall and they didn't have enough supplies. So it was decided a small group would go to a nearby town to get some more things. Mom was part of this small group. She said they had to walk through the forest until they got to the edge to the road that would lead to town. And when they got there, the older people in the group said, Irene, you stay back, mark the trail. We'll go get what we need and come back. So she stood there all by herself, and she said at the edge of town she could smell a bakery in the middle of just baking up what smelled like hot, fresh cinnamon rolls. She was so hungry that that smell was hypnotizing, and she was concentrating so hard on that that she didn't see or hear a truck full of Russian soldiers coming her way. But those soldiers saw that pretty teenage girl. 
And they jumped out of the truck and they chased her. She ran as fast as she could, but they caught her and they beat her. They ripped her clothes off. The gang raped her and they left her for dead in the snow. I don't know how long she laid there, but eventually another truck full of Russian soldiers came by and they saw her little body lying there and they stopped, picked her up, threw her in the back of their truck and dropped her off at a Russian hospital. She was there for a long time because her injuries were really severe, but eventually she got better. But unlike hospitals today that you get to go home when you're better, because of her involvement with the partisans, she wasn't free to leave. She became a forced laborer there and had to stay. But at one point, she found a way to escape that hospital. She got out, she fit through a little crack in the fence, and she ran as fast as she could. She wasn't even sure where she was, but she hoped maybe a town or two away she had an aunt that lived nearby, and so this time, very carefully, she made her way through the streets. But one evening, she said she came to a part of the city that was just strange. The whole area had chain link fencing around it with barbed wire, but the streets were empty. Doors to houses and buildings were left open, windows broken. It was getting late and she was tired, so she found a building, went upstairs and fell asleep on a second story floor. But in the morning, she woke up to screaming, shouting in the, in the street and she went to the window and she looked down. She saw a sight no one was meant to see. Our history books refer to it as a death march. But what mom saw was a mass of people being herded down the street like they were cattle. They were all Jews. Back then, every Jew had to wear an identification mark. In this case, it was a band on their arm with the Star of David. And they were being herded down the street by SS officers and soldiers who were waving guns and shouting at them. Mom said, looking at this, this mass of people, it would be like if the police came and took every single person out from your neighborhood. There was a cross-section from elderly to newborns, families of all ages and sizes. My mom noticed one young mother who was walking with a, a tiny baby, and with no reason at all, a, a soldier grabbed that child and threw it in the air, shot it like it was a bird. They continued to walk down the streets of the town, and mom snuck downstairs. She followed at a distance. At the edge of town there was a, a big field and someone had dug a great big pit in that field. The Jews were forced to stand around the edge of that pit and mom, she found a wooden fence and hid behind it and watched. She watched as the parents covered their children's eyes with their hands and she watched as they were all shot. She said that the ground moved for a long time because people were actually buried alive. Now my mom was raised Catholic and she had a, a really simple childlike faith, but she said watching this horrific sight, she said, I raised my eyes to the heavens and I, I cried out, my God, where are you? How can you let something like this happen? I don't understand. She was so upset that she screamed out, I don't even believe you're there. But as she kept walking, she said that there was one thought that settled into her heart, into her soul, and it was this, that God gives us free will to be good or bad, to help and heal, or to hurt and harm. And it's up to us to decide what we'll do. And she said it was right then and there that she made a promise, a vow, that if there was ever anything she could do to help, she would. Well, she kept walking and she finally found the right town where her aunt lived, the right street, the right house, and just as she was coming up to the, the house, the front door opened up and out came mom's four sisters. Her whole family had gone there looking for her, and she had a great reunion, but it was very short-lived because the Germans took her father away. He was an architect, and they wanted him to build factories for the German war front, and in war, you do what you're told, or you're killed, period. So my grandfather and grandmother and the three younger of my mom's sisters, they went away to be with him, but they didn't take my mom or the next oldest sister. 
because where they were going was next to a facility that trained soldiers and they didn't want the two teenage girls being around that. A couple weeks later, my mom and aunt and sister, they went to church one Sunday morning and when they left the building, they were surrounded by German soldiers who pushed and shoved in segregated people. The very old were put aside and the very young were put aside, but everybody was capable of work, which would be every single person in this room. You'd be put on trucks. My mom was put on a truck with people she didn't know and taken far away to another town where she was forced to work in a munitions factory making ammunition for the German war front. The conditions in the factories were terrible. It was freezing cold and there was barely enough to eat and mom became... And one day a high-ranking German officer, a major, he came by the factory to make sure that production was being kept up. And when he walked by my mom's section, she ended up fainting right at his feet. When she woke up, she was in an office with this man and she was so terrified that if he thought she couldn't keep up, he'd send her further away or just have her killed. So she pleaded with him, please sir, I, I haven't been well, but I, I'm strong and I can do this job. Just give me one more chance, please. This major who was about 60 years old looked at this blonde, blue-eyed, very Aryan looking girl, teenager, who could speak German and whose last name sounded German. Her last name was Gut. And he asked her, are you a German girl? And she answered truthfully, no, I'm Polish. He said, I like that you're honest, but it's apparent you can't keep up here. You'll come with me. I'll give you another job. So she went with him to the camp that he was in charge of. It wasn't a concentration camp, it was a camp that housed German officers and secretaries, soldiers, and mom's new job would be serving meals in the diner. And she was given one other job, and that was to oversee the laundry room. And it was when she went in the laundry room that she met 12 Jewish people who were forced to work there. One had been a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, an accountant, a nurse. These were all people with means. People had homes and things and everything they had had been taken from them and given to someone else just because of who they were. These people were starving, but mom could easily sneak food from the diner enough to feed them. But more important than food, she realized when she was serving meals in the diner and the SS or the Gestapo were there, she could overhear when they were planning raids. Mom could be a spy and listen and get that information to her friends in the laundry room and they could spread it throughout the ghetto. And hundreds of people were able to leave areas before they were raided. But one night, the Major had at his table one of the heads of the Nazi party. And when she went to go serve him, she heard this Nazi tell the Major, next week, don't plan on having any of you Jews here. You'll have to find substitutes. The Major argued, what are you talking about? I've got quotas to fill. How am I going to get my work done without my workers? And this Nazi said, hire Poles, hire Gypsies. I have my orders that by this time next week there won't be one Jew left alive. And mom realized that that meant her 12 friends too. And she had the difficult decision on whether she should tell them that in one week even the little bit they had would be gone. But when she did tell them, they pleaded with her, Irene, do something. Help us, hide us. She said, I've got a little room above the diner. I have a single bed. I have a wash basin. I've got no place to hide 12 people. But that night she got down on her knees and she prayed for a miracle. And in the morning she had a miracle because the major came to her and he said, I'm taking a villa at the end of town. I'm going to be doing a lot of entertaining. You're going to come and be my housekeeper. When she went to the villa, there was one thing she realized, that the house had belonged to a wealthy Jewish family. She could tell by the things in the house that it had been. And she hoped if a wealthy Jewish family had built a house in that part of Europe, somewhere in this house, maybe there'd be a hiding place, she hoped. And so over the next couple of days, she helped all 12 of her friends escaped from the laundry room, out of the camp, down the streets of the town to this villa, down a coal chute, and into the basement, until all 12 of them were there in the basement of the German major's house. 
And she breathed a sigh of relief. Until the major walked through. Irene, this house is filthy. I want it scrubbed and I want it painted from top to bottom. And he made mom arrive the next day with a squad of German soldiers ready to do that. She kept her friends quiet in the basement and started the soldiers upstairs. And when they were finished, she brought the soldiers from the front staircase down, took her friends from the back staircase, hid them in a tiny spot in the attic until the rest of the house was cleaned and painted. Finally, the soldiers left and she was able to bring her friends back downstairs and breathe a sigh of relief until the major walked through again. Irene, it, it looks much better. We're going to start entertaining soon. There'll be a lot of parties and, and a lot of work, but don't worry. I'm going to bring a, a soldier who can help you with everything. He can sleep in the basement. That wouldn't work. So she, she pleaded with him, please, please don't bring a soldier to be with me all day long. I'd be a nervous wreck having him here. She had to explain to him what had happened with the Russians about the rapes. He said, don't be an idiot. Nothing's going to happen to you in my house. You're perfectly safe here. But she pleaded, she begged, she assured him that she didn't need help. I can do everything myself. He said, Irene, we're going to have parties for 30, 40, 50 people a night. Besides shopping and cleaning, there's heavy lifting and gardening and, and cooking and laundry and ironing. One person can't do all that. She continued to plead and beg until finally he said, enough. I'll give you one chance. The first time you embarrass me, the first time you can't keep up, my soldier comes in. So they had a great arrangement because every morning the major would get up, have breakfast, and he'd leave the villa to go to his office, and mom would follow behind with her house key. And as soon as he left, she'd put her house key on the inside of the doorknob. That way, if he came home before he was supposed to, his key wouldn't unlock the door, and he'd have to ring the doorbell. Mom had one of the men down below ring up an alarm bell upstairs that she could buzz and they could hear it down in the basement whenever there was trouble and know to be quiet. Every day they searched from top to bottom that villa hoping to find that hiding place that they prayed would be there. Sure enough, they found it. It was down in the basement. You had to lay on your stomach on the ground. But there was one small panel of wood on the wall that could be removed. And when it was, you saw a tunnel that wrapped around the whole side of the villa and ended in a small room that sat just underneath the gazebo in the side yard. So every day the major would get up and have breakfast and he'd grab his hat, his coat, brief, and his briefcase and he'd head out the door. Mom would follow with her key, put it in the doorknob, and then run to the basement door and open it up and out came all 12 of her friends the men did the heavy lifting and the repair work. The women did the cooking, the cleaning, the shopping, the polishing, the laundry, the ironing. And every day when the major came home, he was amazed at what a teenage girl could accomplish. The nights were filled with parties where the Gestapo dined on the food that the Jews had made earlier. The Jews that had to be so quiet during these parties, they couldn't cough or sneeze for fear of being found out. And that's how they lived for almost two years, until two of the 12 in the basement were a married couple, Ida and Laser Holler. They had been married for a long time and had never been able to have children. And now they found out that they were expecting a baby, a baby that would be born in that basement. And what do babies do? Rotten. The parents desperately wanted the child, but they felt like they had no choice, and my mom was given a list of supplies needed to terminate the pregnancy. She pleaded with them, Ida, laser, please don't do this. I, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I believe it's a sign that we'll be okay, that everything will work out. They've already seen so many innocent people murdered. Hitler is not going to have this baby. Took a lot of convincing, but finally all of them agreed. They would either all live together or they would all die together. And life went on until one day mom had to go into town to get some more supplies for another upcoming party. And when she was in the store, she said two soldiers came in and yelled at everyone, get outside. She didn't know what was going on, but when she left the store, she realized 
The whole town had been evacuated. Everyone in every home and business was now standing on the sidewalks. In the middle of the street, there was a set of gallows that had been erected. There was a Polish Christian family with two small children. They had been caught hiding a Jewish family with a small child in their house. There were signs on every street corner back there saying death would happen if you helped a Jew. Death would happen if you got caught giving a Jew a piece of bread. And not just for you, your parents, your husband and wife, your brothers and sisters, your children. That day in town, everyone was forced to stand and watch what that looked like. Mom said that they hung the children first and made the parents watch. And she said, I stood there with my eyes closed. But even with closed eyes, you can feel and you can hear what's happening. And it was that day, walking back to the village, she said, I was like a zombie. All she could think of is, I can't tell my friends what I've seen. There's nothing they could do about it. But because she was so shook up, when she got back to the villa, she forgot to do what she had done every day for the last two and a half years. What was that? Leave the key in the door. She went into the kitchen and she put her groceries down. She opened up the basement door and she let a few of the women come up to help her get ready for dinner. She said, we were standing there cooking and talking and all of a sudden, there was a noise at the kitchen door, and they turned, and there was the major standing there, his eyes bulging, his chin shaking. He turned right around, and he went to his office where the phone was. Mom told her friends, get downstairs, and she said, I ran after him, and I grabbed a hold of his legs to stop him. He turned around and screamed at her, how could you do this? in my own home, under my own nose, after all I've done for you. Why? She was crying and said, my friends, no one has the right to kill because of race or religion. These people, they've done nothing wrong. Punish me, kill me, but let them go, they're innocent. He screamed, turn you in? You think I can march you to the Gestapo and they're not going to believe I didn't know I had Jews hiding in my own house? You've, you've killed us all. I have, to, I have to go. I have to think about this for a while. And when I do, don't you go anywhere. Don't you talk to anyone. As soon as he left, she ran in the kitchen. She got food and water, went down to the basement, gave it to her friends and said, get in the hiding place. If I don't come back in three days, that means I'm dead. You'll have to get yourself out. And she went back upstairs to wait. Finally, he came back and went into his office, and she had no choice but to go and face him and find out the decision of life or death. And when she stood before him, he reached out and grabbed her by the waist, pulled her down on his lap, and made a decision. I'm going to keep your secret before a price. You have to be mine any time I ask and willingly. Mom said that there was no decision to be made. There was too many lives at stake. And she never told her friends in the basement what she had to do. She said their integrity would have never let her make that decision. But they did all survive. And eventually the Russians started pushing the Germans out of Poland and the whole war front was collapsing. And the Major came to her at one point and said, I've got orders to move my unit. Are you coming with me? And she said, I want to find my family. She hadn't seen her parents or her four sisters in almost five years. She didn't know if they were even alive. And so as he started making arrangements to, to move out, mom contacted her friends, the partisans, who were still living out there in the forest, and said, make room. I'm bringing you 12 people and one very pregnant woman. She took the major's wagon, and her friends by two laid them in the bottom of the wagon covered them with blankets and shovels and food, things you'd need to live in the forest, and rode from the villa out to the forest where the partisans were, back and forth, back and forth, until all 12 of them were there. She stayed with them that last trip, and six days later, a little baby boy was born out there in the forest in freedom. Ida and Eliezer named their son Roman. And mom said holding baby Roman was her payment in full for everything she'd gone through. 
Now her friends wanted her to continue to stay out there in the forest, but she wanted to find her family, and she left. A lot of things happened during this time, but at one point, Mom was captured, this time by the Russians. After all, she'd been the girlfriend of a high-ranking German official, and the Russians accused her of being a spy. And now Mom was put in a concentration camp. She was told she'd be sent to Siberia for the rest of her life. She would just disappear off the face of the earth. And she truly thought her life was over. Now the Russians, they hired men on a daily basis to deliver food to the prisoners. And a lot of times they hired Jewish men. After mom was in this camp three or four months, one of the Jewish men they hired happened to be one of the men she'd hid in the basement of the major's house. And when he came to camp that night, he saw her out there and he called out, Irene, what are you doing here? She said she was so overwhelmed at just seeing a friendly face that she couldn't even speak. She just stood there and cried. He came back later that night with a bunch of friends and they smuggled her out of that camp. They dyed her blonde hair black, they gave her false identity papers, they took her out of Poland and put her in Germany in a displaced persons camp. These DP camps were all over Europe because after the war was over, people didn't know where their homes were, where their families were, it was a place to go and try and figure your life out. Mom sat in this camp for two years she found her father was shot and killed by the Germans because he refused to move off the sidewalk when he was asked. Her mother had a stroke and didn't survive. She couldn't find out anything about her four younger sisters and assumed they had been killed. As the war was winding down, there was a group of men from the United Nations who came to do interviews of the people who survived, and there was an American delegate who came to the camp Mom was at. He interviewed her, and afterwards he said, the United States of America would be very honored to have you. She wanted to try and stay in Poland and find her little sisters, but she was afraid. She was now wanted by the Germans and the Russians, and if any of her sisters survived, she could bring a lot of trouble to them. So in 1949, she came on a cargo ship to the United States alone. She didn't know any English. She didn't have any money. When she came into Ellis Island and she saw the Statue of Liberty standing there, she said, I stood on the bow of that boat and I said, I'm in a free country. I have a new beginning, a fresh start. And she said, I put a do not disturb sign over all my memories. I will never think about or talk about what I've gone through. My life starts fresh today. Mom was able to get a job working in the garment district. She found a little apartment. It took her five years, but she became a United States citizen. And to celebrate, she decided to go to a fancy restaurant in Manhattan. It was really crowded that day. There was just one empty chair in the whole place. And as she was eating, a man came up and said, may I sit here? And then he looked at her. I know you, he said. He was the UN delegate who had invited her to the US, the very man that she talked to in the DP camps. He asked the pretty young blonde out to dinner that night. And the next night, and six weeks later, they were married. My parents moved from the East Coast out to Southern California where I was born, and mom became an interior decorator. She was really good too. She could come into your house, she could sketch, she could sew, she could just say, oh, darling, we can do this, we can do that, and it will be beautiful. And until I was 14, that's all I knew about my mom. She never talked about these stories. True to her word, she kept that do not disturb sign up. It wasn't until we were having dinner one night, the three of us, and the phone rang, and on the other end of the line was a college student who was doing a survey for a report in school. My mom's the one who answered the phone. He was taking a random survey and his topic, the Holocaust never happened. It's just propaganda drummed up by the Jews so we'd feel sorry for them. He was calling random people to, thought, to find out what they thought. He found out what she thought. She started telling this amazing story and I remember looking at my dad at one point going, what is she talking about? He was the only person in this country who knew her story because he'd interviewed her all those years back. 
I remember when my mom hung up the phone, tears streaming down her face from bringing up these, these memories, and her looking at us saying, all these years that I've kept silent about what evil can do, I've allowed history to repeat itself. Because when we don't stand up and speak out about what hate does, it will repeat over and over again. And she said, I'm willing from now on to go anywhere to talk to anyone. And that's exactly what she did. She's traveled all over the world. Now I get to. But her favorite audience, no matter where she went, was getting into the high schools. Because she would want to talk to you. She'd want to hug you too. She'd want to tell you that you're the future generation. And it's up to you to make different choices. I have a topic for my mom's talk. It's kind of a weird one for a Holocaust, but the topic is love. And the reason I say that is love is what's required for these things to not happen again. To care enough about another human being to stand up for them, to realize that they're part of our family and that we're all connected. You know what I've learned as my mom's daughter? That when you love people like that, you get back so much. Your life goes from this size to endless. My mom received a phone call in 1982 from a young man named Roman Holler. you remember who he was? The baby that was born out there in the woods? He wasn't a baby anymore. He was a grown man whose son was about ready to be bar mitzvah, which meant he was turning 13. He looked all over the world for my mom, who he called his mom, so that she could be a part of that ceremony. But when she met up with Roman, she found something incredible. And that's what happened to the major, the man she'd lived with as his housekeeper. When the war was over, Major Edward Rugemer went back to his wife in Germany. Only his wife heard he'd had a long affair with his young Polish housekeeper. And she wanted nothing to do with him. She refused to let him back into the house. And so he went to his friends, men in town he'd known his whole life, but there was rumors going around about the major. He'd become a Jew sympathizer, people were saying. There was big fear associated with that. And this man, now very close to 70 years old, had nowhere to go. He was literally forced to live on the streets. When Ida and Laser Holler heard about what happened to the major, they took baby Roman. They put him in the back seat and they drove to that town in Germany and they searched the streets and they looked at every homeless face until they found him. And then they put him in the back seat and took him home. The Roman grew up calling him grandfather until the day he died. That's a huge example of what forgiveness looks like. I want you to remember two words from this talk, love, forgiveness, because they're huge. They change lives. They soften hearts, they change attitudes. People always ask me when I got involved in this story. I wish it was when I was 14, but truthfully, when I was 14, I had a lot of interesting stuff going on in my own life, and I thought her story was cool, but it didn't really affect me. It wasn't until I was about 21, my mom was asked to speak at an inner city school in Watts, in Los Angeles. This was a school that was on the news every night because of gang violence, stabbings, shootings. It's the fake kind of a place my mom liked to go to. But about a week before she was due to speak, she got a call from the principal who said, Irene, we need to let you know that we've had a lot of anti-Semitic threats about you coming. We've had swastikas painted around the school, and this morning someone in red spray paint on the steps leading to the school wrote, Jew lover, stay home or else. And we would totally understand if you would like to cancel. And my mother says, I will not be intimidated by bullies. So he said, what that I'd like you to do is you'll drive to the LAPD and an officer will escort you to school, he'll stay with you and he'll take you back to your car afterwards. And my mother answers, Oh, honey, that will not be necessary. My daughter will drive me. Yay! <laughs> so that day, I drive her in my little Camaro, and we drive to the parking lot, into the school, and school's just starting, and these students are coming in. And I use the word student really loosely, because these guys look like they were 30 years old. They were big, they had facial hair, the games were so evident, even in the parking lot, they walked together and you could feel the hatred 
between them. My mother is totally oblivious to any of this. She gets out of the car, marches across the parking lot, and I'm following behind her. We go up into the school, and the principal, he invites her to go into his office so he can talk to her, and he tells me to go in the gymnasium because that's where the assembly is going to be held. So I go in there, I sit in the bleachers, the bell rings, and these students come in. They are so loud. They're so rowdy. There's things flying all over the room. They use language and words I'd never even heard of before. And as I looked at their face, the only thing that I was absolutely positive about was that the last place they wanted to be in the whole world was sitting in there listening to some little old lady talk to them about the Holocaust. And at one point, the principal comes out in the middle of the basketball court, and he's introducing my mom, I assume, because I can see his lips moving, and he's holding a microphone. But it is so noisy in there, you cannot hear a thing. And I remember sitting on the bleachers thinking, this is going to be such a train wreck. And then from one end of the basketball court, here comes my mom. She's so little with her white fluffy hair. She looks like a cotton ball crossing the basketball court. And she grabs the microphone and she bats her false eyelashes. And she says, good morning, my darling children. I'm so happy to be here seeing all your beautiful faces. And I want you to know that I have come here today because I love you. It took me a few minutes to realize that I could hear her. It was as quiet in there as it is right here. But what blew me away was afterwards. These kids that wouldn't even be in the same room together unless they were forced to, were now standing in line next to each other on their knees because they were so tall and she was so little. So they could give her a hug and a kiss and I watched one after another do just that and then kneel back to the end of the line so they could do it again. And that's when it hit me, the power of love. When you can stand before somebody you don't know, who may look different than you, who may think different than you, who may believe different than you, who may speak different than you and say, you're part of my human family and we are all connected and I care about you, and I want to get to know you, and I will stand with you. It changed that group of kids that day, and it really changed me, too. So in closing, if my mom were here, this tiny little white-haired woman would tell you that one person can make a difference. Each one of you has within you the power to change another person's life. You can do that multiple times a day by the things you say or don't say, the things that you put on the internet or don't put on the internet, the stories and gossip that you can stop and not spread, the friends that you can make, the people that you can befriend that are lonely. You have multiple opportunities. It's super important to get a good education and get a good career. But nothing is more important than being a decent human being. And I guarantee in the road that you're sitting at, there's people that have pain and suffering and loneliness and things going on in their lives. And they could sure need a friend. They could need someone that would make a difference. I believe that could be you. Thanks. You guys have been an awesome audience. Thank you. Do we have any time for questions? All right, eight minutes. We have to go back to class. Do you uh, have any questions at all? Anybody? We are in the process of making a major motion picture of my mom's story. So if you ever in the future hear about a movie that's coming up that sounds vaguely familiar, go see it. Bring your family. We'd appreciate it very much. Any questions at all? Mm, yes. Um, when did your mother decide to start 
Um, shortly after that phone call, um, it was, I think, I mean, literally, I think a week after she got that phone call, somebody, my father worked uh, for a company that had people come and talk every week, and that week the person who was supposed to canceled, so my mom went and filled in, and, and there was a newspaper reporter there who wrote her story up, and then she just started going after that. Yes, it would be 1978 or 9, something like that. Yep. Um, do you wish you would have known about the events that occurred in your mother's life before she told you? Um, do I wish I would have known about the events before? You know, I, I don't because honestly, first of all, the Holocaust wasn't taught in Southern California when I went to school. I never even heard the word. And I, if it did, I wasn't paying any attention. Um, so I don't think I would have appreciated it any earlier. And as it was even at 14, I don't know. I guess I thought maybe every mom had a story like that or something. I didn't really get the, the profoundness of what she had done, really, until I was much older. I think I'm slow or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Not seeing any hands. So, oh, back corner. Back corner. Yes. Have you ever had any intentions of going back to the place where you from? Have I ever had any intentions of going back to pull it? Yes, I've actually gone back three times, um, all last year. So, um, I found the town that she lived in and the town that she spent some of the war years in, and gone to some of the concentration camps. It's uh, it's sobering. I have cousins there. My mom's sisters um, all passed away, but um, I have a lot of cousins on Facebook that I talk to. So when we do the movie, it'll be in Poland, and um, I'm hoping I'll be there long enough where I can get to know some of my cousins. Yes? Did your mom ever find her sisters? Yes, she did. I don't know. Do we have time? No. My mom was speaking to, this is a good story, my mom was speaking to a huge group of people in L.A. and there was a couple right in the front row who came up and said, Irene, we're going to Poland, we'd love to try and help you find your sisters. She said, it's been 40 years. My mom tried her best to find her sisters. Poland was under communist rule until the late 80s. She said, my sisters are dead. Maybe one survived and she gave the names, Janina, Maria, Bronia, Waja. This couple went to Poland, and when they were there, they were diligent. They checked with the consulates, the embassies, with every local Catholic church they could find, and came up with nothing. On the last day, in a taxi cab, on the way to the airport, they asked the cab driver if he could pull over at a little store because they wanted to buy snacks. It's a long plane ride home. And he found a store. They got out. They got their stuff, went up to the shopkeeper, and they thought, let's try one more time. And they pulled that list of names out. Do you know these women, Janina, Maria, Bronia, Wajagut? The shopkeeper said, I've never heard of them. But there was a woman who'd been shopping in the back of this little store, and she came running up. She grabbed the list out of their names, and she pointed at one of them and said, this one is me. These others are my sisters. And so this couple was able to give my Aunt Bronia my mom's address, and 10 days later, mom got, well, mom called it a telegram from heaven. It was a letter from all four of her sisters saying, we found you, and we love you, and we can't wait to see you. So after four decades, we were able to get my mom a plane ticket back to Poland. I remember driving her to LAX. She was so excited. All she could talk about was every memory she, she could think of of her sisters, how tall they were, and what their hair looked like, and how they could sing, yada, yada. She could have flown to Poland herself. She was that excited. So she gets on a big plane and she flies into Warsaw, which is the main city in Poland. And then she had to get on a small little commuter plane to go to the village where her sisters were going to be waiting for her. And I talked to her the very next day. She's so funny. As they were landing in this village, she said, I was looking out the window for my four beautiful sisters. And there stood four gray-haired babushkas waiting for me. I didn't realize they were getting old, too. I can't imagine what that was like to get off the plane and hug them and to go into their homes and meet their families. She got to see her parents' grave sites. Pretty special. Thank you. Appreciate it.